So today we're going to do a little something different. I do demos all over the place and wanted to change up on my demos. And so what I've been doing a little bit is ring making. And today we're specifically going to talk about inlay rings. And so this is a green opal inlay ring. We'll take and do this start to finish. I know you're saying, Mark, this is 10 minutes to better pen making, not ring making. I completely get it. Just consider this one then a free video on me. Cool part about doing ring making is it's stuff that we already have. We're only going to have to acquire one new piece, and it's this. This is a ring maker's mandrel. And if you look at it, it's stepped. And what we're going to be able to do is put our ring on here and do all our turning on here and our finishing on here. Otherwise, we already have all the equipment. I love to use easy wood tools, so we're going to do some carbide tools. We're going to use glue boost to secure the opal into the ring. And then we're going to go through our standard finishing process and be able to buff this thing out to have just another little beautiful ring that we're going to have. So with that, let's get right into ring making. Okay, as I mentioned in, in the introduction video, this is not going to use a lot of tools that we don't already have. We basically have everything we need except one piece that I'll talk to you about. But what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at making inlay rings. And here's a... Here's an example of one of the inlay rings I recently made. Here's an example of one using a slightly bigger stone on here. The challenge for any of this stuff is being able to, to photograph it. I mean, it is just a dramatic color when I'm looking at, at this in natural light. And so inlay, ring, inlay rings differ from traditional rings just a little bit. So if you've ever seen the wooden rings, and I've got another video on this one on making wooden rings, Here's the traditional wooden ring. And the core on here is different than the core that we're going to use. Here's a traditional ring core. And you can see here the edges are basically straight. And that all the, there is comfort in it. This is all rounded over in here. It's a very comfortable ring to wear. But what we typically do is we'll drill a hole in the wood. We'll glue this into it. And then we'll do the turning. That's not how we do an inlay ring. An inlay ring is significantly different. And if you see here, here's my inlay ring. And you can see here there's a channel in there. And the channel is where we're going to be putting our inlay material. And that's going to allow us then to put a finish over the top of the inlay material. And then we are going to do a little bit of turning on here to get it so that it's smooth. We'll finish it off. We'll buff it out. And we're going to have a beautiful inlay ring. So when you're using these bigger rocks, or the, the fine or the medium crush on these things, you really have to account for the fact that they're not going to cover all the surface that's inside that channel. And the best way to think about it is if I had a box and I was putting rocks in there, I would have big gaps in there. But if I put sand in there, I don't have those big gaps. So on something where I'm putting the bigger stones in there, I'm going to want to make sure that I have something to back it up. And so what I'll do is on this ring, I will use a typical Sharpie marker and I'll just color it in and that will give me the backdrop that I used on this ring. And I'll get to that one in a second as to when we would do it. But now if you're going to do something like the uh, fine opals, like on this ring, this is a fine ring, I didn't color it on the back. And the reason is because I'm not seeing any kind of bleed through of the ring when I'm actually doing it. But I'm going to warn you that if you do color the back of it, it can significantly impact the color just like it does in acrylics, right? We've talked about it in my acrylic videos, the color and the reflection. So this I, is the same exact stone as the pink. They're the exact same stone in here. And what happened was I did color this one black. And I used a Sharpie marker on here first. And what happened is the opal becomes so transparent that it picked up the black. And you know what? It is a cool effect. It's got some purple and some greens in there and things like that. But this is the exact same color as this. So just be aware when you're actually doing your ring prep that there is a significant impact of the material that we're using. This is going to cause some experiment 
experimentation on your side. But you know what? That's all part of the fun. So let's take a look at what we're going to do today. So as I said, this is the medium grade of Opal. And that was the one that I did on that first ring that I showed you. And what we're going to do today is we're going to do some more of the fine, fine Opal. And I, I really started to like this stuff on here. So this is the fine Opal. And it's going to be more like the sand material that I talked about earlier. So we're not going to have to do any kind of color prep on this one for it to go through. And the concern would be that if we actually did color prep it, it might have an impact on the on what shines through. So, you know, you may experiment with prepping it white to get a little bit more vibrance. I found that what we're going to do today, just leaving it the natural uh, color of the ring, we're going to be fine. So... If you've seen my other videos, I always use these turn between center mandrels. And the nice thing about that is that's what we're going to use to actually prep the ring and get the opals onto the ring. I've made these things. This is just a simple Delrin rod. And you can see here I, I cut it basically to the length of my, my mandrel part of, of this bushing. And then this one too. And I've Cut them at a 45 degree angle just to give me a little something so I can move these on here. And then just clamp it down. Or not clamp it down, just, just tighten it in. And you can see here now I'm all set up, ready to go to be putting on anything that I want inside that channel. If I was to do the coloring, now is the time that I would do the coloring. I would take my Sharpie marker, I would rotate this around, and I would do my coloring in here. As I said, in this case, I'm not going to do that. I don't even. I want to keep the clarity of the green, and I want that green to really pop. So, what I found is actually getting the, the opals on to the ring is probably the most complicated part and does require a little bit of practice. So, I have found that I use these little... You know, in my day and age, we used to call them Dixie Cups. They're the little cups that you use in the bathroom. And I'll take some of my opal right out of the package, and I'll simply pour it into my Dixie Cup. Maybe even a hair more. You're purchasing this opal in grams, in one gram container. And I found just through experience, one of these things covers about three to three to four rings depending on how, uh, how, uh, how big the ring is and how much opal you're putting onto it. So, now I've got the opal inside my cup. And I don't, I don't want to pour it in this way. So what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to take my cup and I'm going to crease it. Now that gives me a nice fine point for when I'm pouring in the opals on top of my ring. So there's two different schools of thought on putting the, the opal onto the ring, and I'm starting to favor the second one. So I've seen on, on other videos is that people put the opals on here, and then they'll dab a, a dip of glue on there, and then that will harden the opals onto the core. The challenge with that now is if I have to go back in and I want to add more opal, and say I, I got a spot where I don't really like the coverage on my ring, if I want to add more opal, the problem with that is, obviously, now I've got something covering the opal. So I can get around that by simply putting the opal, on, sorry, some of the glue on first, and then the opal on top of that and work my way around. And we're going to show you that in a second. So for my glue, I, I love glue boost. So I'm going to use glue boost here to adhere my opal to the ring. They do come with this nice top that you can get the extender for. And what that gives me is that I've got pinpoint control as to where I'm putting the glue on here. So you're going to see, I'm basically going to put a little bit of glue on there, and then I'm going to pour my opal on there, and I'm going to work my way all the way around the ring. So let's get started. So I'm going to put a dab of glue across here, and then I'm going to... Get my opal on there, and then I'm gonna dab it with a quick spray of accelerator. So the first one that I do, I don't do real heavy. 
And so now you'll see that I can now put in, now that's going to act as a stop, and I can definitely go a lot heavier now. So I'll put a little bit more glue here, just a little bit. And then I'm going to take my opal, and I can go a little bit firmer. I definitely want to get that opal in there. And I can take my thumb if I want and just press it in. I'm going to put a little bit more opal on here. And I'm trying to get it to line up on the previous spot. Hit it with a little accelerator. That makes it fine to the touch. All right, so now I've gone through my first pass. And I've got opal on almost all of it. And you can see here if I look real, real close, there are spots that I don't like. And so now what I'm going to do is kind of go through a second pass and fill it in. And now that's the benefit of not having put the glue on top of it is now when I put this back on, I'm able to get the stones into the area and still have it so that it, it's getting a very nice consistent uh, layering on there. If I did it the other way and I had glue on top of it, now when I put the new stones on there, they're sitting on top of the glue. So in this case, I'm just going through here. I'm looking at it. I don't mind touching it because you know what? In the next step, we're going to be turning it. So if it's fragile to touch, it's going to be fragile to turn. So I'll just come back in here where I think I got something that's a little bit lighter. I'll put in a little bit more stones and work my way around. Okay, now when you see here, I have it completely covered in stone. You don't have to worry about the ones that are just flaying on the side. Your finger will just be able to rub them off. And I've got all my stones into where that ring is going to be. So now I'm going to take and I'm going to actually use the fill and finish, the thin, as the covering and actually as the, the bonding agent. And I am going to put a small drop all the way around the ring trying to keep it only on the stones and i will use my accelerator every so often just to get that that bond that we're looking for so you can see here i'm just going to take a small drip and i work my way around it i'm going to take another small drip You can see that one even ran, so that's fine. I can see right where it ran to. It ran right to about there. We're trying to keep it onto the ring as much as we can, but if it goes a little bit onto the, um, the core, it's not a big deal. We'll either be able to take that off when we're doing our final real fine sanding or just using our fingernail on top of this thing so this thing has now been completely set up and it's ready to do our turning you can see if i put my fingers on here i can feel it i can feel that it's all solid on here so now i'm going to switch over and i'm going to get us ready to do the turning okay now we're ready to do some of the turning and this is about the only thing that you know as a pen maker you don't have that you'd have to pick up these are called ring turning mandrels and they're basically the same concept as a pen mandrel but you can see here it, it has an expansion and contraction so what you do is you take your ring whatever ring you're going to work with you slide it up to here till it finds the shoulder see it, it kind of snapped in at that spot and then i'll simply take it and tighten it up and now it's locked in there and then i'll attach it to my four jaw chuck this is a Vicmark 4-jaw chuck. I love using this thing. So I just simply put it into my Vicmark 4-jaw chuck, and I tighten it up, and we're ready to go. So a couple things, though, that I want to point out in terms of being able to use, use this and actually do the turning on here. As you can see here, I am set up with this little um, round toolbar. And it's a lot smaller than the traditional toolbar that comes with your lathe. Here's the one that comes with my lathe. You know, it's this huge, big, heavy piece of steel. 
you're probably familiar with it. But if you do any kind of pen turning or any kind of delicate turning, you're going to want to go to something like this. You can see if I had to use that longer, longer tool rest, I would be way out here with, with where that tool rest could be because I have to get it around here. I might be able to tuck it up into here, but if I tucked it up into here, it, wouldn't, it would crash as I got it over to here. So you can see here the big advantage of having this small little tool rest is that I can get my work much, much closer down to where I'm going to actually be turn doing my turning. And that gap is not as bad as it would be if I had to use the bigger turn. I use Easy Wood Wood Turning Tools for, for doing this one. This is their square cutter. This is, comes from the pen turner set or the micro set. I love this. You're going to see here, all I'm going to do is I'm going to simply turn the machine on. I'm probably going to go to about 1200 RPM. And I'm going to just take really, 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 really soft, delicate cuts onto this piece to make sure that I get it down till, till I level it. I know the big thing that scares people is if I hit the stainless steel, first and foremost, don't put that thought into your mind. You just know you're not going to do it. You're going to be delicate and it's going to be fine. If you do hit it, remember, we're doing carbide tools on the stainless steel. They do that every day. That's something that's the beauty of using carbide tools, right? Is that you use carbide tools to cut your metals on a metal lathe. So we're not going to get any gouges. We might get some sort of minor scratches. But if we get the minor scratches, we're going to take care of that when we're doing our final finish on here and doing our sanding. So with that, I'm actually going to do the turning. Turned out I'm at 1600. I'm going to take the tool the way that I always grip it. Now I'm going to stop and I'll kind of show you, if I go up closer, it's hard to see my shavings. I don't have big chunks of anything coming out. This is fine powder and little ribbons that I have coming off my tool. So I'm not taking very deep cuts. I'm just going along the surface on there and I'm taking, you know, just a delicate cut. And one thing that I mentioned in other videos, but you can kind of tell here when I'm actually turning this thing on and off, is if you hear, you don't hear my lathe popping on and off. I never turn my lathe off. And as you start to do different projects, you're going to find, you're going to appreciate why you don't want to do that. So when I do a pen, I'm always turning at the highest speed. So on my, on my Powermatic, that's 3200. So I'm going 3200 RPMs. If I was to put a bowl or a platter on this thing in this chuck afterwards, I don't want to turn it on and have it going at 3200 RPM. So I will always turn my lathe off, if you will, using the speed control. And then I'll turn it on and engage it using the speed control. You'll see it's a lot safer to do it that way. So then this way, I'm never going to have to worry about having something big on there and having it to want to fly off. So you can see here through a little bit of time-lapse photography, I don't have, uh, didn't show you all the cutting there, but I'm rubbing my finger around it now to see if there's any kind of little voids in there. If there's any kind of little void in there, I'm simply going to take my finish, I'm going to put it in there, and I'm going to knock that out. And so now I've just got a little bit of final turning on here. Everything is off the edges. Everything looks good. I can feel that I got a little bit of a bump here that I'll take care of now, and we should be good. So finishing this ring is going to be techniques that we've used quite a lot. I'm going to remove my tool rest just for safety. I'm going to start out at 320 grit sandpaper. Then I'm going to use my 400 grit sandpaper. And then I'm going to use a couple products for polishing it up. You know, I've always used hot, so we can use hot. And we're going to finish it from there. So finishing, I'm going to go to nothing a lot, probably around 600, 645. Is where I'm at, and I'm sanding this. And yes, I'm trying to stay just on the opal, but if I hit the stainless steel, I'm not all that worried about it because we're going to just buff the whole thing out and we're going to have a beautifully buffed out ring. 
So there we go. 320. Now we're going to do 400 dry. Now I'm going to do a little bit of 400 wet dry. And I'm going to do it where it's wet. And you can see here, when I do it wet, it's going to pick up some of that... Uh, it's going to get a little bit darker in color because of the fact that we're doing the stain that we're doing the uh, ring. And so I am going to go the other way on here. Do all my sanding on here. Once again, I know it's hard to see on here. I really wish there was a great way to uh, film any of these opals or even take pictures of the opals, but it's just a challenge. So now what we're going to do, I'm going to use a little bit of hot polish. Sorry, Novus. I do Novus too. I'm going to turn this thing on. I'm going to introduce it here. Kind of watch my fingers on here. Then I'm going to fold this up a lot. And I'm going to buff it. You can see it's just gorgeous. If I was concerned, which I am a little bit about with my fingers being that close, I can simply roll this down, take this off, flip it to the other side, lock it in, tighten it up. For this last little bit, you know, I can bring my headstock up if I want. I don't necessarily have to. But you can see I'm actually getting the buff here because you can see the, the color moving over to here. So now I'm going to just take it onto this side. And I'm going to buff this ring out. I may want to put just a little bit more compound down there. And then if I want to take it over to my buffing wheel, I can get my final buff on it. But let's peel it off. Let's take it off, and let's take a look at the ring. So I'm just wiping it down with my paper towel on the back side. And I know I'm not going to get the vibrance, but let's see how easy that was to actually turn this ring. So there we go. We got the ring. With all the color in there. You can see here there's no scratches. On the stainless steel they were all buffed out. After our post turning process. So we didn't have to worry about it. And there you go. So you're only limited to. Whatever your mind brings up when you're doing these inlay rings. So as you can see, the process wasn't that hard. We went through all the steps. We filled in all the opal into the channel that we have. We talked about how to get it in there, how to recover our opal. We went through the ring maker's mandrel. We went through sanding. We went through finishing. You don't have to worry about, as I said, nicking the ring as long as, you know, it's going to be something that we can buff out. We don't want to nick it out. And more importantly, it's a great skill builder. If you saw the turning on here, it takes some precision. It's a nice skill to have when we're doing our pens. So as always, I thank you for watching the video. If you have anything that you want me to cover in terms of ring making or something that you do better and want to comment on, once again, this is just the way that I do it. I'm always looking for open, open suggestions and comments. For me, it's just a way to facilitate the conversation put it down in the comments below. If you like what you saw, give me a thumbs up, give me a follow, give me a subscription. Next couple of videos, I promise you, we're gonna get back to pen making. This video made possible by the fine folks at Exotic Blanks. For all your pen making needs, Exotic Blanks has you covered. Find them at www.exoticblanks.com and also by 
Penmakers International, the educational source for pen making.